Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Fit RX. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Dennis. I'm very excited about today's guest for several reasons. One is the topic is cool, uh, as is her accent. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll notice she's not from around here. So um, she is from Australia, and I absolutely love those accents. So um, I could probably talk to her all day. But uh, my guest is Alex Stewart, who uh, is the author of a book and a website titled Low Tox Life. So she's going to educate us about all the toxins in our life and maybe some steps we can do to get rid of some of the, the big ones. And uh, so Miss Stewart is an educator. Again, she founded Low Tox Life in 2010. So she's been doing this for a while. She's a uh, also a columnist for Wellbeing Magazine and a speaker and consultant. So uh, very happy to have her here on my show. Um, so Miss Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, been with my husband for nearly 20 years. I like hearing Miss every now and then. Makes me feel younger. So thanks for that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, well, tell us uh, first just, about your journey and how you got involved in the, uh, you know, this kind of low tox life. Mm. Uh, so it is completely accidental. Uh, I can't stress that enough. I was moseying on through life, uh, actually more like charging through life in high end hospitality. I was running the best bar in the country at the time, winning a bunch of awards uh, training the largest hospitality group in Sydney uh, across all the bars and restaurants and very sick. And when I say very sick, look, I mean, it was more about, for me, repeat infections. So I could never seem to let go of this tonsillitis that would come up every three, four months. And then I'd be on the roundabout with the doctor and then the prescription and then get better for a few months and then get it again. And I got, um, I became resistant to the antibiotics that uh, treat strep throat. And now um, I had no idea about antibiotic resistance at the time. This was over 20 years ago. Uh, but it was kind of scary because there was literally nothing we could do. A friend of mine was dropping over a soup one night uh, when I was really sick. I'd taken the third course of the strongest antibiotics. And she's like, have you ever thought about seeing a naturopath? And I didn't know what that was. Uh, you know, our, our holistic medicine community has really exploded over the last decade and a bit. Uh, but back then it was someone you really had to try quite hard to find and seek out. Um, and given I had no other options, I thought, you know what, what have I got to lose? I went and saw this magnificent naturopath who'd been practicing for 25 years. She just asked me questions for an hour. She asked me about every aspect of my life that had never happened to be to me before in a medical appointment. So I was, I was like, it was almost like when you come from a conventional uh, treatment background, it's like, what is with the questions? Mm -hmm. But at the end, uh, she prescribed some really disgusting tasting herbs, which I've since come to love. Um, and a couple of key nutrients for the immune system. And I was better in three days. I couldn't believe it. Uh, so I went back to her when I got tonsillitis again. I'm like, okay, we're going to need to do that thing again because I've got it again and I get it every three months. So if we could do this every three months, this would be amazing. She's like, no, but there's obviously a reason that your immune system's being suppressed. Let's dig. And she found some research connecting non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which again was very new at the time, to overgrowth of strep. And so we trialed going gluten-free, which again, 20 years ago was not easy. Uh, and um, but the thing was, it worked. I literally, if I don't eat gluten, I don't get tonsillitis. It is that simple for me. So gluten is obviously a massive immune suppressant for me, an inflammatory food. I don't think it is for everybody. I disagree with the bandwagon form of health where all the cool kids say one thing's bad. And so all the people have to, I have plenty of French relatives who've lived till the ripe old age of of 90 plus, um, and they eat bread daily. Uh, and, and so I don't subscribe to that 
idea that something is inherently bad, but we do have to look at our agricultural practices, our hybridization practices in different countries. And if you eat gluten from America and Australia, it's very different kettle of fish from eating it in France um, with the way they farm. So now that I know all of this, uh, I can even eat bread in France, but here I cannot. In America, it's the worst. That's where I have my worst reactions, probably because of the higher level of glyphosate use with desiccation practices and things. But suffice it to say that that was what kicked off my holistic journey, uh, which was then um, confirmed by going back to see Christine for another thing where I didn't get a period for three years after quitting the pill and had been told I had early onset menopause. But again, with the disgusting herbs, she got me swinging again in six weeks. I had a normal cycle. Uh, so I was hooked by this stage. I was like, there's obviously this whole other way where we build the body up with the tools it needs and set the stage for health within the body by what we choose to eat, what we choose um, to do in terms of stress. And then that's when I was having a baby a couple of years later and started to look at the products. You get all the well-meaning baby shower stuff. I was like, oh, I'm pretty good at reading food labels now. I'm a good detective. Let's have a look at this stuff. And I was horrified. I saw a ton of names, chemicals that I had no idea what they were. I'd been in cosmetics uh, in the earlier part of my working years. Um, and I used to proudly talk about the wild Aegean sea algae that we were using for the anti-wrinkle creams and things. But we never got trained on what all those chemical names were in the bottom two thirds of the label. And for the first time in my life, I was looking them up and I was finding carcinogenic potential in some of the chemicals. I was finding really harsh skin preservatives uh, that can be contributors of eczema, asthma, uh, eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, hives even. And I found hormone disruptive chemicals, uh, which can alter, block or mimic um, natural hormone signaling in the body. So by this stage, Greg, I was like, okay, I've been a teacher, trainer and motivator across cosmetics, across hospitality. I'm really good at making the people not panic when there's bad news and distilling it to what we need to do to move forward positively. I wonder if I can bring those skills to this space. And I had a little think about what that might look like. And I really wanted to create a lifestyle that didn't feel rigid or black and white or exclusive in any way. Uh, because, you know, anyone who lived through the 90s watching Oprah interview the next new celebrity diet person where you did the diet and then you went, didn't look anywhere near as good or feel anywhere near as good as the person who created the protocol and then you'd feel ashamed and like you were failing in the background. And I just, I'd been part of that shame cycle in health where you don't do it correctly and therefore you're the problem. And I didn't want to ever have anyone feel like that on my watch. And, and so I thought about terms that were more inclusive, that were more accepting of where people might be at and different backgrounds. You know, different people have time and money. Some people have real time and money constraints. Uh, some people can switch all their products to new low-tox products in a day. Other people have to try and find more thrifty, frugal ways to do that and and so after a few hours on, uh, you know, inspo boards and things, low tox was born as a phrase and I looked for it on Google. It wasn't anywhere. This was about 2009 and the low tox life was born. And over time, I articulated it to be food, body, home, mind, and an overarching care for our planet home, which is essential to all those other things being able to be worked on. And so that's it. I just started helping people make healthy swaps, uh, you know, and giving people different price points, different DIY options, started running the courses. And then a few years later, a publisher reached out and said, we need to make this a book. And that's how the book was born back. I think it was 2017 now. Okay. Wow. Well, very yeah. nice. Well, that's a perfect segue. Let's get into the book. And, and you start off by defining the low tox life, which I think you, mm. you already have. Um, and then you just get into the, the different systems, which you mentioned. So let's start with the, the low tox body, which is our, our personal care items and, you know, hair and nails and, you know, mm. teeth and, and, and all that. Um, 
I mean, we don't have time to go into to every single one, you know, but yeah, uh, maybe hit some highlights out of this category mm. as far as maybe, you know, the, the things that are the, the worst and, and some ways we can, uh, good alternatives, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that we don't often think of as personal care for me is water. Uh, and water goes into our bodies, it fuels all of our cells, or it can do not so great things to introduce um, harmful chemicals into our cells. Uh, now, I'm not a proponent of the words the word chemical being a bad thing because our world is made up of many, many, many chemicals that are completely wonderful and safe and life-giving and providing. But when I'm talking about nasty chemicals, I'm talking about uh, often the man-made chemicals since the chemical revolution of the 1940s, post-World War II. And what we find in the average tap water is a lot of um, trace heavy metal, trace runoff from agriculture, so pesticide, herbicide, or local council spraying for that matter. Um, and uh, we find chlorine, in small amounts, uh, we find fluoride, which, you know, half the world fluoridates, the other half does not. And I think it's up to the individual human to look at the reasons both halves give for choosing that and making your own decision while um, while uh, governments are still debating that. But at the same time, what I know to be true is that fluoride in excess is neurotoxic and it's not a fluoride deficiency that causes tooth decay. It's a mineral and nutrient deficiency and a high sugar or high um, processed carbohydrate diet that does that. Um, so I, I personally feel that it's important to remove that from my water and I'm urging anyone out there to explore the topic and make your own decision. Um, so that for me, a water filter would be the number one place I would start for body care uh, because of how intimate our relationship with water and hydration is and getting a really good water filter that removes all of those contaminants to the best of its possible ability. Usually it's like 99.9%, mm -hmm. um, but also that replaces the mineral loss in that removal because you're removing everything Um you need to put back in the good stuff and that is minerals. And if you have like say reverse osmosis where it doesn't go back in uh, and it is just a completely clean water, then you mm -hmm. can put a little tiny pinch of salt in and that sorts that out. Mm -hmm. So that would be my number one. Uh, my number two would probably be your body lotion. A lot of people go straight to the face, which I get, but our body is a lot bigger than our face. And if you're using a daily body lotion, um, and a daily moisturizer, and you have to make a choice as to which one you're going to focus on swapping out first, I would go with the body lotion simply because of the surface area of the organ that we call skin. Uh, and the main things you want to look at on a label are from making sure that the word parfum or fragrance isn't used on the ingredient list. And if it is, that it has an asterisk and that somewhere on the label it says, uh, natural essential oils um, and that you see phthalate free, P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E um, free, which means it's not going to have the endocrine disruptive chemical uh, in the fragrance. That's really important. The next thing you want to make sure isn't in there are another form of endocrine disruptors called parabens. So you have the propyl paraben, methyl paraben, definitely want to make sure those aren't in there. And I find, Greg, the easiest thing is to actually shop in places where it's easy to make a good choice instead of heading to a mainstream uh, supermarket or Walmart and, you know, thinking you have to be a detective. Mm -hmm. If you go somewhere like uh, your local health shop or a Whole Foods, uh, Whole Foods is sometimes, but like 95% of the things in there are going to be so much better than what you find in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Um, and so online can also be a really good option to shop in a green, healthy online um, space because then you have to do less detective work. They've done most of that for you. So once we've done body lotion and water, I'm going to give one more 
And I would say it is your shampoo because we're literally rubbing that into our scalp. Uh, and again, we want to make sure there's no synthetic fragrance in your shampoo. And we also want to make sure there's no sodium laurel or laureth sulfate. Sodium laurel sulfate laurel is actually not a harmful, completely biodegradable, especially if it's from coconut or sustainable palm. Um, I'm thinking of like the Sal Suds Dr. Bronner product, which is a fantastic gel cleaner for the house. Um, but what is harmful is sodium laurel sulfate to personal care because it's an irritant. So it's a great cleaner for your laundry product or when you're scrubbing out the bathroom tiles, but it is not something good to put on your skin, especially if you have a tendency to eczema or dermatitis or psoriasis flare-ups. So definitely want to make sure you don't have any sodium laurel sulfate in your shampoo or conditioner, a hand wash for that matter, body gel. Um, and then actually I'm going to give one more for the body. Just switch to bar soap. It's so easy. It's so much cheaper. Um, it's so much less plastic in the world if we just make that tiny, simple switch. So we save money, we save plastic, which means we save petroleum resources, which means we save energy, which means we put out less carbon. Like I think it's really exciting when you start to see one simple change and the ricochet effects of that change out into the world. What percentage would you say, uh, you mentioned some of those chemicals, uh, if somebody is not being conscious of this and which is, is going to be most people and they go to Walmart and they're just buying, you know, name brand shampoo and, you know, name brand soap. And then they're putting lotion all over them. And then of course, most people are using sunscreens, uh, in the summertime. I mean, are, would you say most of the commercial products have these chemicals in there that, that you mentioned? Yeah. Yes, they okay. do. Yeah. And um, because um, they're cheaper and they can make things smell like special and yummy uh, based on the conventional idea of what we think is special and yummy. And, uh, and it, it's really just about starting to realize what is fake mm. and what is actually natural and starting to raise our awareness around that in itself will make you go, oh, like how the, on earth do they get a shampoo to smell like strawberry vanilla anyway? That's yeah. so synthetic. And then you just kind of get better at making choices off the bat simply by being aware. And if somebody were to say, well, I feel fine and, you know, why should I quit using all these things, you know, mm. the, the commercial products? I mean, what what would you tell them? Yeah. So that's such a great question. And look, I felt fine. I mean, other than the tonsillitis, otherwise I was a very healthy, super fit looking, uh, 20 something, um, bartender, but, uh, I had never had a regular period. I'd always had female problems. Um, I always got pimples around my period. Um, things that were obviously clues that there were hormone issues, um, you know, the thing is, Greg, we, we say we feel fine, but if, if someone like Christine sat us down and asked us questions for an hour, you'd be like, oh, actually, yeah, I do get headaches around my cycle end and oh yeah, actually. And then all these hormone problems are actually there, but it's because we've got them all around us with all of our friends and it's just normal. Um, we've forgotten what optimal actually looks like. Mm. And most people are not operating from optimal yeah. when you really dig around and ask a whole bunch of questions. Um, and if by some chance you luckily are, um, you know, the research is showing that phthalates can contribute to abnormal male genital growth if you're exposed to phthalates uh, having a baby boy in utero. Uh, based on a study they did on um, workers in the phthalate factory with boys being born with micro penises. Um, you know, there's some pretty crazy research that says even if you feel fine now, what is this doing in the long run? When is it going to show up for you? Is it going to show up in uh, estrogen related cancers uh, later in life? And all of the things that are showing in the research to be potential um, for people. So for me, 
it's it's really just a no-brainer. If the research says that there are obvious groups of people being harmed by these chemicals when they're exposed in high levels, it simply just means we're exposed at a lower degree or later after um, accumulation, um, depending on the type of chemical, whether it accumulates or whether it's uh, water-soluble, of course. But it's, yeah, I, I would say to that person, that's great that you feel fine. Um, do you ever get this, 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 this or this hormone problems, uh, which invariably most people are going to say one or two, oh, yeah, I do. Um, or how about we look at the two studies that really concern me? I really want to share them with you because for me, even if everything's okay now, I am not okay with this chemical being in circulation. I'd love to know what you think. And then you share that. You know, we have these dynamics. I have a joke in when I give talks, which is often to big groups of women. And uh, we, I'll, I'll say, who here has had a partner or a teenager get the shits with them, excuse my language, for um, nagging that everything is toxic and you can't use that and we've got to change to this. And the whole room just kind of roars with laughter because most people are that person in their family. And I'm like, well, think about it. You've got to be a better marketer. You have to know your stuff. So you have to at least know a couple of studies off the top of your head that say irrefutably this stuff sucks and we should stop using it. Let's find a new option. But also it's very uncool to be the, um, the boss of other people in your family. It's very unsexy to be the boss of your partner. Um, and it's very uncool to try and be a teenager's boss. So get them on side. Say, I've been learning about this, you know, um, I'm not comfortable. Like, can you read this study as well and tell me what you think? Can you watch this documentary and tell me what you think? Because if you're there, a member of all the Facebook groups and doing all the research, watching all the documentaries, but you're doing it alone <clears throat> and then you proclaim that everything is toxic and everything has to change in the house, um, not many people are going to come along willingly, you know, especially if they haven't been given the chance to have a taste of what you've been learning. So that would be my recommendation if you have um, people who are, um, shall we say, resistant. being obstinate, yeah, yep. resisting. Yep. Okay. Uh, before we move on to the next one, so what, you talk about um, nails and obviously women, you know, like getting their nails done. How yeah. How bad is that? How toxic is that? Well, I am a big fan of looking at your life overall. And so if that lady is getting her nails done on a Monday with a girlfriend and that is soul filling for her um, and she's eating mostly organic home cooked meals for the rest of the week and doesn't use fragranced products in the house, like, um, you know, uh, fabric softener and, and candles and air fresheners and all that kind of stuff but she just really loves getting her nails done, then sit by the door where the door's open and there's some fresh air, maybe wear an N95 or better mask and just do your thing. Like I'm not into a completely black and white approach. However, there are several chemicals in nail polish where if overall you are still experiencing a lot of toxic exposures, maybe still eating junk food, um, and you were thinking, yeah, I'm pretty good at doing my own nails, then maybe invite the girlfriend over, find a good low-tox nail polish that doesn't have the big five, uh, the top toxic chemicals that you do find in nail polish, and make a night of it. Have a cheese and wine board, uh, pop on a really great movie, do each other's nails, and, uh, you know, have the windows open. And then you have this fantastic low-tox experience the creams you'll be using will be much better quality than in the average nail salon as well. Uh, and a lot of people pick up fungal infections in nail salons, um, which isn't talked about enough, and they can really stick around and become very annoying. Yeah. Um, so if it's something you feel like you could let go of, then yeah, it's it's a great one to let go of. But if you're doing everything right and it's your one pleasure, like I I, I colour my hair. And I use the lowest tox possible, but it's something I'm going to do every month. I'm not going to beat myself up about it. Um, it's my thing. I do great in so many other areas that I don't lose sleep over this. 
Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, and absolutely. I think yep. I Good just advice. think it's more of a mental health check for me to just say, you know what, it's not going to be perfect for like 99.9% of people are not mm-hmm. going to achieve perfection. So why do we keep trying to judge each other for against that standard? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. One yeah. or two things shouldn't break the bank. We have sure. a ton of detoxification you know, systems in our body that are protecting us all the time. The problem with our detoxification systems getting overburdened is incessant 24-7, 365 day a week, multiple chemical exposures. So if we just focus on bringing it all down, um, then our bodies can handle things a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, well, let's talk about the home. So next chapter is low tox home. You mm. discuss uh, cleaning products, cookware, plastics, you know, clothes, all that stuff. So give us maybe some highlights from that section. Yeah. So I just briefly mentioned there uh, fragranced products in the home. This would be my number one category to attack and eliminate. And this is definitely not a category that you leave in your, oh, but I'm so good everywhere else. I'm going to keep these because fabric softeners, air fresheners, scented reeds, scented candles for the most part, uh, all contain huge amounts of phthalates that we are breathing in. So that is, the phthalate is actually a plasticizer compound. It's not a fragrance itself, but it is a plasticizer compound that is used in fragrance, artificial fragrance, to help the fragrance stick and stay really powerful. So, you know, like you hug a maid at the gym and then you go about your day and then you can kind of still smell the cologne on your t-shirt like at 5 p.m. That is the phthalate doing its job to keep that fragrance lasting long on your skin. And we see that as a picture of success. But what it actually is, is a marketing tool to make us think long lasting fragrance is success when actually the phthalate plasticizer compound being added to artificial fragrances is anything but successful if we consider the success metric to be human health because phthalates are endocrine disruptive chemicals specific to estrogen and you don't want men having too much estrogen exposure and you certainly don't want women having uh, artificial estrogen exposure blocking and, and mimicking their natural hormone signaling. So I would have a look around your house and think, am I using scented candles, reeds, fresheners, plug-in air freshener systems, um, bathroom air freshener cans and fabric softener, box them all up, put them in the garage. Don't throw them away just yet, but just do a detox. Just don't have them in the house for two weeks. Use natural options uh, or just don't use those products at all and save a ton of cash. Uh, and then bring them back after two weeks, open everything up, use it all again, use your fabric softener, switch on the air freshener plug, uh, light your candles and see how you feel. I have taken over 8,000 people through our Go Low Tox program and everyone has had the same reaction, which is to say I felt winded, I couldn't believe how strong the stuff was, It felt poisonous. I immediately got a headache. Uh, And it is simply because we have come to tolerate at a subconscious level all of these things that we call beautiful, yummy smelling products and that we've never really questioned. But when we remove them and then are exposed to them again after a couple of weeks, it is so toxic. You feel it. You feel that these things are not good for you. And it's a wonderful way to put the fire in the belly to make more changes, I think. So that would be where I would start. Um, If you really love having a scent through your home, you could explore natural essential oils and get a diffuser. Um, But just keep those simple as well. A lot of people go nuts with a bunch of florals and that can create allergies Uh, or cause headaches as well. Stick to things like lemon, peppermint, rosemary. And the good news is they're all the cheaper ones anyway um, when you're buying from reputable companies. And uh, and that can be your home fragrance plan. Then in the home, I think the most important thing I want to talk about here, because there's a bunch of switch-ups in the book that you can just follow along and it's really easy, but I want to talk about mold because mold in the home is highly toxic. And in the past, we've just seen it as this annoying, smelly stuff. 
but we've never really connected the dots between it and poor health outcomes. Um, I've personally lived in a water damaged building uh, and become horrendously unwell uh, with a syndrome called chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And uh, I, I would never wish it on anybody. So if you live in a humid part of the world, um, so Southern states and the East Coast for you guys over in the States, here for us, it's the East Coast in Australia, um, then you need dehumidification. You just need it. If it rains a lot, if you have a wet season, you absolutely need to invest in good dehumidifiers so that you can keep your indoor air humidity in your home under 60%. That is absolutely key. Over 60%, mold will grow. Um, so once you've eliminated the potential for leaks in your home, so always doing a six-monthly check of pipes under sinks, um, anything that smells musty, getting it checked. Get a leak detection person out and see if there's a leak somewhere because the longer you leave those things, the more expensive remediation becomes if mould starts to grow in subfloors or ceilings or walls. Um, so you always want to stay on top of any kind of trade repair. Forget the handbag you were looking at at, uh, the department store that you really wanted to get. I Trust me when I say fixing the leaky tap in your kitchen is a bazillion times more important once you've been through mold illness. It, I would never wish it on my worst enemy. And, uh, and I think if you are someone who is chronically unwell with no answers and you haven't looked into mold, it would be the first place I would start to look. Probably Lime and tick bites would be the second, but mold is so common. Estimated in the US that about half the buildings in some way are water damaged. Uh, and then if you add the statistic of about 25% of humans being unable to detect mold as a toxin and eliminate it in our bodies, uh, that's a lot of people wandering around with arthritis when they're in their thirties going, why am I so sick? Or why have I got chronic fatigue? Or why am I twitching and tremoring? Uh, why am I having these neurological symptoms like anxiety when I've never been a stressed out, um, anxious person in the past? Do I feel better when I'm not at home? And if you start to kind of your ears prick up at some of these questions, uh, then you want to be exploring mold. But the best thing to know is that most people simply live in a humid area, but they're not keeping their humidity un indoors under 60%, which you can do through air conditioning, that helps. Um, but dehumidifiers are just gold. And it's honestly my favorite appliance. Living in somewhere like Sydney, February, it's about 80% humidity on average. And so we need to run our dehumidifiers to keep the humidity down, to keep our soft furnishings dry, to stop mold from growing on our shoes, to stop mattresses from growing mold. Uh, when people invest in dehumidifiers, their lives change. People write to me constantly about how game changing it is. So they will be the artificial fragrance and the mold would be my top two home recommendations. Okay. Talk briefly, if you will, uh, before we move on about uh, cookware and plastics and uh, yeah. those kinds of things. Cause I know that's a, a, a big one. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, and you know, who didn't get invited to a Tupperware party with their friend and like, you know, invest in this huge system and, mm -hmm. and then only to later on find out that there was a bunch of BPA in nineties Tupperware. Um, so yeah, really important to start shifting away from the use of plastic for storing food in any way. Plastic leaches in heat, uh, it leaches over time, uh, and uh, there is both gas vapour and particle um, exchange uh, when it comes to plastic for food storage. Uh, we certainly don't want to be heating anything up in plastic. Uh, I think everyone's got the memo on no microwaving plastic containers anymore, um, but if you don't, that's definitely one place to start. And then um, just switching over to stainless steel and glass for your storage solutions, um, for putting your leftovers in the fridge um, to use the next day or for freezing. Uh, and a lot of people are like, oh, but isn't my glass jar going to break if I freeze it? But if you keep one inch off the top of the liquid, like if you're making a big batch of broth um, and you decant it into the jars, just don't fill the jar right up to the top. 
and don't screw the lid on super tight. Um, just place them all nicely with a good gap at the top um, before the lid and you will never have a broken, broken glass jar doing it that way. So that would be my number one. Number two is we want to get the Teflon out of the um, kitchen. So any kind of, well, broader than Teflon, given that that has been outlawed since 2015, people might have some old pans kicking around uh, that are supposedly non-stick, probably with a few scratches by now. Um, but you would definitely want to be um, uh, either replacing yourself if you can now or formulating your next birthday or Christmas list uh, so that you can ask for a strategic um, low-tox swap uh, gift. Um, but you want to be moving to your cast iron or your stainless steel cookware, um, whichever works best for you. There is some green pan uh, ceramic technology now that doesn't have any chemicals from the PFAS family. Um, PFAS are the, that forever chemical group um, that traditionally have been used in non-stick or waterproofing uh, kinds of products. And so um, you still see today non-stick pans that still have PFAS in them. They're just not the PFOA, Teflon. They're the PTFE cousin, which still is a forever chemical, still will never break down in the environment. And so while it might be a little bit safer to human health than PFOA Teflon, uh, it's still a disaster environmentally. So we want to move away from all of those types of chemicals and embrace, uh, you know, the old arts of sealing a cast iron pan uh, to the point where it becomes a nonstick cookware item, uh, having some stainless steel, having a good ceramic pot for slow cooking, um, uh, I'm thinking like those French brands like Le Creuset or Chasseur um, that have great lead-free research to make sure that they don't contain any heavy metals. Uh, and then those would be the things I would cook with. If you really need to get a ceramic green pan, a nonstick pan, you can, but they just don't last that long. All it takes is a scratch you know, teenager, like lazily using a fork to make their scrambled eggs and then boom, that thing's going into landfill. So I'm a real fan of cookware that's going to last. And for me, that would be enamel, stainless steel or um, or cast iron. Okay. Uh, well, next section is food. And yes. this uh, shouldn't be anything new to my listeners. We talk a lot about nutrition and stuff on this podcast. So um, obviously a lot of the you know, the processed foods we eat is just full of, of junk, but, um, you know, kind of summarize that chapter, if you will, what's some of the, the really bad stuff that we should just stay away from. Yeah. And on the first page of my book, I, I talk about a girl I know, um, and a whole list of foods, uh, and, and habits. I, I want to let people read that because it's a bit of a, an aha moment, but, you know, Greg, I think, food has become so incredibly complicated. It's been hijacked by big food companies. Now it's also being hijacked by um, climate change tech. And look, I am a huge fan of doing everything we can to restore the natural balance of carbon in our atmosphere and on, on our earth. But there are always going to be trying people trying to make money out of uh, anything we need to change quickly. And to see the uh, artificialization, which is not a word, but it really makes the point of food moving even further from nature uh, than we even are now, uh, for the so-called good of us and the planet, I, I don't buy that. Um, I'm big on getting to know our farmers, looking at how we farm and methods of farming that are extractive so intensive to the earth and, and harming in the long term or regenerative, which means the farmer leaves the, the farm in a better place than how it was found. And uh, if you need inspiration, there are so many fantastic farmers out there. I'm thinking of my friend in uh, Southern California, Paul Greaves, uh, who does some fantastic work um, in the regenerative poultry space. I'm thinking of Joel Salatin, who really sounded the alarm for everybody on what should be normal with our food system and what should not by rehabilitating his family farm in Virginia. I've had him on the show and it was just so inspiring to talk 
through some of the things that they've done over the years. We have to start looking at eating food from sources that are regenerative because what is happening in a regenerative farm is you are constantly making sure that there is biodiversity, that there is soil, microbe and fungal diversity, that there are a ton of nutrients and minerals in that soil as a result of the farmer doing that regenerative work, which comes up through the food and then nourishes us. The problem is right now cost and access. So anyone who can afford to start farming is shopping at a farmer's market through regenerative farmers who are practicing ways like biodynamics. Um, if you eat meat, looking at um, pasture raised, grass fed and finished, uh, rotational grazing methods being used. Um, I, I'm thinking of silvo pasture, all of the regenerative methods then you are saying, okay, I am committed to this. I can stretch my budget to this and it's my responsibility to do so because there are millions of people who cannot right now. But if enough of us do who can, then we start to actually shift the market and we start to actually shift agriculture. And for me, that's a really, really important thing. So that might all sound really intense and like, oh my God, I don't need, I don't, <laughs> I'm not at a place where I can understand farming practices. Where do I start? The most important place to start, if you're not a nerd yet, who can start to look at different types of farming practices and ask questions and, and find a regenerative farmer. If all you have access to is a supermarket right now, then the most impactful thing you can do is switch as many of the items in your trolley as you can from products to produce, fresh food. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been buying too much packaged food, too much ultra processed food. Uh, and uh, when we look at the statistics, it's estimated that about 30% of global disease is attributable to diet, 30%. Uh, and yet here we are. And knowing this, why aren't we all doing more to focus in on this? Uh, and that is a very complex conversation. Uh, I, I think, you know, speaking to an American, you would be familiar with Citizens United, where basically in that bill, companies, industries, lobby groups were allowed to funnel as much cash as they wanted to politicians through donations. Uh, which for me was a real turning point south in terms of health of people, health of planet, because money talks, unfortunately, and people people act uh, based on who's paying them. Um, and so uh, unfortunately that's where we are, but every single person has the power to change their shopping trolley today in small increments. It doesn't all have to happen overnight. I always say change one little thing a week and then you don't even notice it. So if you're buying barbecued flavoured rice crackers for your kids for snacks, this week you could just switch to plain. So at least you're not getting all of those processed additives and flavours on the cracker, and that's a nice little step. Then you could introduce some smashed avocado with those crackers to boost the nutrients or make a hummus at home or make a sweet potato dip if your kids still have a sweet tooth at this point. And just inch over to the place where you can then serve a plate of crudités, a few cubes of a nice cheese and some fruit, and that becomes the snack. And it, ha it happens gradually. Otherwise, your whole family is going to absolutely freak out and say, what the heck is this? Yeah. Um, but just do it in baby steps. Cut the flavoured stuff out and go to plain. Then introduce whole food uh, accompaniments. To start making tasting plates instead of just serving the crackers, you serve some of this, some of this, some of this, and some of it starts to become like berries and uh, their favorite fruit and a cap carrot sticks and the crackers. And then the crackers can disappear later. Uh, and I find that that's the most powerful thing that any person can do today. We don't need to go into what you have to quit, which food groups, yada, yada. That's something to talk about with your doctor if you still have health problems after just simply swapping out the products and moving to produce. Most people find that making that change alone makes them feel 10 times better. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I tell people all the time, they my listeners have heard this, but eat foods with one ingredient. So, mm. uh, and it is you know, a tomato, yeah. and that's it. Yeah, that's, that's it. what yeah, I'm it's eating. Got one yeah. ingredient. Yeah, that's it. And <laughs> it, if if people would just live by that one rule, which is difficult, I I get it. Mm. Uh, it it would um treat most chronic diseases or or prevent most chronic diseases from from mm -hmm. coming on. I'm I'm convinced of that with what I do. But anyways, yeah, great advice. That's it. Uh, well, lastly, you talk about the low tox mind, mm. uh, and I had made a note on being earthed and grounded. So what is having a low tox mind about? So for me, this comes right back to what I was talking about when I was articulating how I wanted to guide people. When I was setting that intention, when I started, you know, birthed the phrase low tox and created this low tox life. I didn't want anybody to feel stressed and freaking out about this process. So for me, stress is, well, not for me, actually, in the science, we see that stress is one of the biggest drivers of disease right up there with food uh, in busy modern life. And it is so important that we work from a place of relaxed curiosity I wonder what it might feel like to make this change and how great would that be to use less plastic packaging and all this packaged food I'm ditching and how lovely is that for the planet instead of I have to eat produce and it has to be 100%. Like I have seen so many people stressed out of their minds when they go to a friend's house, they're trying to eat everything organic and then the friend's cooking a barbecue and the sausages have additives and like they freak out. Um, that is going to kill you much faster than eating the odd sausage that doesn't have the most perfect ingredients on the planet. So looking after our minds and the state of our stress response is critical to overall health. We experience stress. It's impossible to be a human and not go through life with stressors. But what we can observe and work on is our response to stress and our ability to bounce back. Uh, from stressful events, whether it be a shitty email from your boss that kind of puts you in a cold sweat and it's like, oh my gosh, they want to have a meeting with me. I didn't do so well in the report that they asked me for. You know, that can really make us feel awful. But if you carry that email with you over the next week, feeling awful and being in knots and, you know, you know, then creates diarrhea and then, you know, like, Everyone listening will have experienced this in their lives. What we need to work on is the bounce back. So working on our nervous system health is critical, making sure we have moments in the day uh, where we pause, where we put our feet up, where we take a few deep breaths and just relax our adrenals and put ourselves in a calm state and then get on with our day. All those little micro actions are going to help us bounce back from the everyday stresses that life throws our way. And you mentioned grounding. This is one of my absolute favorites. So even if you live in the city, I live in inner Sydney, so it's very urban, but a 10 minute walk that way, I've got a beautiful botanical garden. Uh, 50 meters up the road, I have a little grass patch that I often take my dog for his last minute wee in the night before we all go to bed. And I can just take my shoes off and connect with the earth. You might have a forest. There might be a beach, a local park, whatever it is, a verge on the footpath. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to go on a health retreat that costs you $2,000 to get earthed. The science shows us that 50 minutes a week of barefoot in ground, whatever that natural ground is, is enough to show signs of lowered blood pressure, stabilized blood pressure, reduced cortisol, uh, and reduced inflammation. 50 minutes over seven days. So that's like less than 10 minutes a day uh, is what we're talking about. So you might want to do that in two really lovely long excursions in the park where you walk for most of the park walk barefoot if it's safe in the grass to do so. 
Um, I wouldn't do so in tick season in the States. I know that that's a, a big issue for you guys. Um, so uh, maybe just be somewhere a bit more controlled for your grounding time when it's tick season where you can keep an eye on things, maybe just do a meditation in the grass outside your house or in your garden if you have one. Um, but it's massive, right? And it's nothing. And maybe you're thinking, oh, but I don't have 50 minutes to carve out. Do you call a friend? Do you call the school to have a chat to your kid's teacher? Do you call to make some sort of appointment this week? Do that barefoot in the garden. Just start to incorporate it. Do you put the clothes out on the line in your garden? If you do it barefoot, then you're starting to accrue those 50 minutes pretty naturally and consequentially, rather than having to create this new pocket of time. You know, I think we often think, oh, but I don't have time to add something new. Think about where you could incorporate that thing into what you're already doing. And then it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. I like it all. Great advice. Um, so do you tell people, because when they're listening to this, um, I, I don't want people to get overwhelmed as I'm sure you deal with this all the time because they're like, <laughs> yeah, Oh my yeah. God, there's, it's hopeless that, you know, I, I hear this from patients when we, and I don't go as in depth as you do, but, uh, when we have these conversations about some of these things and they're like, well, you know, it's, it's just, you know, they throw their hands up. Well, I'm not going to do any of it because I can't, you know, there's just, there's too much. I mean, there's, the air mm. we breathe is bad. The cosmetics I yeah. use is bad. Uh, you know, the food we eat is bad. I mean, it's just, it's hopeless. Uh, so do you just tell people like you've kind of summarized to just kind of take small baby steps? Is is that your recommendation? I mean, do one thing at a time and just kind of gradually get into this. Absolutely. And I always say we do what we do most of the time so we can go with the flow some of the time. So as you're making great changes, the world around you isn't going to change as fast. You might have the fire in your belly now and you're all fired up and you're going to start making the changes, but you're going to notice that the world is not changing as fast as you are in terms of doing better by people and planet. Uh, and you're going to go to that barbecue where the food is less than ideal based on your new standards or you know, all the kids are going to be at the um, bowling alley with you guys and everyone's going to want an ice cream and your little Johnny is also going to want that ice cream. And that's okay because you're doing what you do most of the time. You can go with the flow some of the time. And I think that is key to mental health in a world that is still largely convenience, processed food uh, and high toxin in terms of uh, personal care and body products. But I can tell you from when I started this work back in 2010 to now, 13 years later, most of the large manufacturers have made massive changes. They are using less and less genetically modified ingredients because consumers said, I don't want that. They're using less and less synthetic fragrance because consumers are saying, I don't want that. So if you think, oh yeah, but you know, I can never make a change. It's just me. It's not just you. People are wising up everywhere and every little change we make sends a message. Every time you choose the low tox washing liquid that doesn't have the synthetic fragrance and every time you don't buy the fabric softener that does have the synthetic fragrance, that sends computer messaging to the buying system about what to reorder and what to not. And I think if we think about it that way, we start to realise wow, yeah, I actually do make a difference. Every single choice I make is making a difference, is sending out a little ripple of information that says, don't want this, do want more of that. And that's powerful. And enough of us are starting to do it, that companies are starting. I mean, you see so much. We're obviously now in a phase where there's a bit of green washing, where, you know, the, the, let's put a picture of the earth on our product and take one of the bad things out so that everyone thinks it's ecological. So, there's still a bit of detective work to do to make sure something is green and low tox, but it is all going in the right direction because enough of us are saying it's enough. Yeah. And that's exciting to me. Yeah, very good. Well, this has been great information. Um, as we wrap up here, I always ask my guests if they could give us one health tip that would make us healthier today. What would you say to that? Sometimes it's hard to pick one, but... It is always hard to pick one, but I'm going to say, have a look at your shopping trolley the next time you're out, 
have a look at how much of it is packaged and see what you can do to move the needle towards more fresh food uh, because the packaging is not just a sign of a pretty crappy subpar subnutritional product inside, but it's also representative of a huge amount of carbon going into the atmosphere uh, from the plastics, uh, from the shipping, uh, from the crazy amount of processing in factories. And we, by just switching from products to produce wherever we can, are not only flooding our body with crazy amounts of fantastic nutrients that we need to survive and thrive, but we're also saying no to that highly energy intensive processed food system uh, that is costing us and the earth massively. So for me, that is honestly just the most exciting change we can make. Okay. Yeah. Great advice. Um, So for people to learn more, they can go to lowtoxlife.com. You have a book called Low Tox Life, and um, I think they can order that on your website or probably find it on Amazon or anywhere. Yeah, yeah, you can get it on Amazon. Okay. For sure. Uh, and then I forgot to mention at the start that you also have a podcast called the Low, Talk, Low Tox Life Podcast. So I do. We're in our right eighth there. year now. So oh, wow. Over You've been at it a while. Yeah, yeah over uh, 320 shows I think we're up wow. to. So, wow. And we actually categorize it. Um, you have a directory. So if you're really interested in the body right now or food or the mind, we actually categorize it so you can just head to all the shows that are around that topic. Um, so that's helpful for people. Okay. Well, very nice. Uh, well, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for um, having Mrs. me, Greg. It's Mrs. Been awesome. Alex Stewart. So <laughs> it's uh, all good. I was just joking with yeah. you at the start. Okay. Well, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot, and I hope everyone did as well who is listening. And uh, as always, um, appreciate everyone listening, and we will talk to you next time.